the things they carried. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross carried letters from a girl named Martha, a junior at Mount Sebastian College in New Jersey. They were not love letters, but Lieutenant Cross was hoping, so he kept them folded in plastic at the bottom of his rucksack. In the late afternoon after a day's march, he would dig his foxhole, wash his hands under a canteen, unwrap the letters, hold them with the tips of his fingers, and spend the last hour of light pretending. He would imagine romantic camping trips into the White Mountains in New Hampshire. He would sometimes taste the envelope flaps knowing her tongue had been there. More than anything, he wanted Martha to love him as he loved her. But the letters were mostly chatty, elusive on the matter of love. She was a virgin, he was almost sure. She was an English major at Mount Sebastian, and she wrote beautifully about her professors and roommates and midterm exams, about her respect for Chaucer and her great affection for Virginia Woolf. She often quoted lines of poetry. She never mentioned the war, except to say, Jimmy, take care of yourself. The letters weighed 10 ounces. They were signed, Love Martha. But Lieutenant Cross understood that love was only a way of signing and did not mean what he sometimes pretended it meant. At dusk, he would carefully return the letters to his rucksack. Slowly, a bit distracted, he would get up and move among his men, checking the perimeter. Then at full dark, he would return to his hole and watch the night and wonder if Martha was a virgin. The things they carried were largely determined by necessity. Among the necessities, or near necessities, were P-38 can openers, pocket knives, heat tabs, wristwatches, dog tags, mosquito repellent, chewing gum, candy, cigarettes, salt tablets, packets of Kool-Aid, lighters, matches, sewing kits, military payment certificates, sea rations, and two or three canteens of water. Together, these items weighed between 15 and 20 pounds, depending upon a man's habits or rate of metabolism. So it's interesting, so far the book is named The Things They Carried, the chapter is named The Things They Carried, and we see how much things weigh, listing all this military stuff between 15 and 20 pounds. But if you go back to the paragraph before, he mentions that the letters weighed 10 ounces. And it seems like that would make some sense. These guys are infantrymen, they walk everywhere, they carry everything. So every little choice they make is going to add up in terms of what they have to carry and carry around this country of Vietnam. And so everything, even as small as a 10 ounce letter, will be important to them. Henry Dobbins, who was a big man, carried extra rations. He was especially fond of canned peaches and heavy syrup over pound cake. Dave Jensen, who practiced field hygiene, carried a toothbrush, dental floss, and several hotel-sized bars of soap he'd stolen on R&R &R in Sydney, Australia. Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside the village of Tan K in mid-April. By necessity, and because it was SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, they all carried steel helmets that weighed five pounds, including the liner and camouflage cover. They carry the standard fatigue jackets and trousers. Very few carried underwear. On their feet, they carried jungle boots, 2.1 pounds. And Dave Jensen carried three pairs of socks and a can of Dr. Scholl's foot powder as a precaution against trench foot. Until he was shot, Ted Lavender carried six or seven ounces of premium dope, which for him was a necessity. Huh, they've mentioned this guy, Ted Lavender, twice in one paragraph. Kind of interesting that he's the only guy who gets mentioned a couple times. Let's see if this matters. Mitchell Sanders, the RTO, carried condoms. Norman Bowker carried a diary. Rat Killy carried comic books. Kiowa, a devout Baptist, carried an illustrated New Testament that had been presented to him by his father, who taught Sunday school in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. As a hedge against bad times, however, Kiowa also carried his grandmother's distrust of the white man his grandfather's old hunting hatchet. Now here's an interesting thing that they're carrying. This is the first time we see something that is not tangible. Everything else has been stuff. Boots, backpack items, weaponry. But now we see that Kiowa carries distrust of the white man. Something that's not tangible, but clearly it weighs upon him. So it may not have a physical weight, but it seems to matter because he carries it with him. We also have a nice juxtaposition 
of Kiowa, who's a Baptist, it says, carrying something like the Bible, which would seem to be promoting peace and love for all, but then at the same time carrying a hatchet, which could be an instrument of hurting, killing, or death. So we get that juxtaposition between tangible and intangible items, but also between peaceful and obviously not peaceful items. Because the land was mined and booby-trapped, it was SOP for each man to carry a steel-centered, nylon-covered flak jacket which weighed 6.7 pounds, but which on hot days seemed much heavier. Because you could die so quickly, each man carried at least one large compress bandage, usually in the helmet band for easy access. Because the nights were cold, because the monsoons were wet, each carried a green plastic poncho that could be used as a raincoat, or a ground sheet, or a makeshift tent. And there's an example of that polysyndeton that we talked about, which is very indicative of O'Brien's style, the overuse of conjunctions when making a list. So rather than just saying, could be used as a raincoat, comma, ground sheet, comma, or a makeshift tent, we see him use or between each item in that series. With its quilted liner, the poncho weighed almost two pounds, but it was worth every ounce. In April, for instance, when Tad Lavender was shot, they used his poncho to wrap him up, then to carry him across the paddy, then to lift him into the chopper that took him away. And so for a third time, we see Ted Lavender's name being mentioned. Again, the only person who's named multiple times, so this story of Ted Lavender seems to be pretty impactful. I think we're going to want to figure out what exactly that story is about. They were called legs, or grunts. To carry something was to hump it as when Lieutenant Jimmy Cross humped his love for Martha up the hills and through the swamps. In its intransitive form, to hump meant to walk, or to march, but it implied burdens far beyond the intransitive. Almost everyone humped photographs. In his wallet, Lieutenant Cross carried two photographs of Martha. The first was a coat of color snapshot signed Love, though he knew better. She stood against a brick wall. Her eyes were gray and neutral, her lips slightly open as she stared straight on at the camera. At night, sometimes Lieutenant Cross wondered who had taken the picture, because he knew she had boyfriends, because he loved her so much, and because he could see the shadow of the picture taker spreading out against the brick wall. The second photograph had been clipped from the 1968 Mount Sebastian yearbook. It was an action shot, women's volleyball, and Martha was bent horizontal to the floor reaching, the palms of her hands in sharp focus, the tongue taut, the expression frank and competitive. There was no visible sweat. She wore white gym shorts. Her legs, he thought, were almost certainly the legs of a virgin, dry and without hair, the left knee cocked and carrying her entire weight, which was just over 100 pounds. Lieutenant Cross remembered touching that left knee. A dark theater, he remembered, and the movie was Bonnie and Clyde, and Martha wore a tweed skirt. And during the final scene, when he touched her knee, she turned and looked at him in a sad, sober way that made him pull his hand back. But he would always remember the feel of that tweed skirt and the knee beneath it, and the sound of the gunfire that killed Bonnie and Clyde. How embarrassing it was. How slow and oppressive. And again, we have a nice juxtaposition here. We have... Lieutenant Jimmy Cross kind of putting the moves on Martha, so kind of insinuating some, so kind of implying some sort of loving moment. At the same time, the movie they're watching and the scene they're talking about is Bonnie and Clyde, which were two thieves of the, I think, 1920s. And the ending scene is where they get all shot up and killed. So we have the potential of a beginning of a new relationship juxtaposed with the clear ending of another one. He remembered kissing her goodnight at the dorm door. Right then, he thought, he should have done something brave. He should have carried her up the stairs to her room and tied her to the bed and touched that left knee all night long. He should have risked it. Whenever he looked at the photographs, he thought of new things he should have done. What they carried was partly a function of rank, partly a field specialty. As a first lieutenant and platoon leader, Jimmy Cross carried a compass, maps, code books, binoculars, and a forty five caliber pistol that weighed 2.9s fully loaded. He carried a strobe light and the responsibility for the lives of his men. And again, we have that nice juxtaposition of tangible items, 
like the book, the binoculars, the gun, juxtaposed with the intangible item, the feeling that he has the responsibility for all the lives of his men. As an RTO, Mitchell Sanders carried the PRC-25 radio, a killer 26 pounds with its battery. As a medic, Rat Killy carried a canvas satchel filled with morphine and plasma and malaria tablets and surgical tape and comic books and all the things a medic must carry, including M&Ms for especially bad wounds, for a total weight of nearly 20 pounds. And again, in that long list of things that Rat Killy carries, we're able to hear polysyndeton again. It slows our pace. It makes us see every item individually with that addition of conjunctions between each item. As a big man, therefore a machine gunner, Henry Dobbins carried the M60, which weighed 23 pounds unloaded, but which was almost always loaded. In addition, Dobbins carried between 10 and 15 pounds of ammunition draped in belts across his chest and shoulders. As PFCs, or Spec 4s, most of them were common grunts and carried the standard M16 gas-operated assault rifle. The weapon weighed 7.5 pounds unloaded, 8.2 pounds with its full 20-round magazine. Depending on numerous factors such as topography and psychology, the rifleman carried anywhere from 12 to 20 magazines, usually in cloth bandoliers, adding another 8.4 pounds at minimum, 14 pounds at maximum. When it was available, they also carried M16 maintenance gear, rods and steel brushes and swabs and tubes of LSA oil, all of which weighed about a pound. Among the grunts, some carried the M79 grenade launcher, 5.9 pounds unloaded, a reasonably light weapon except for the ammunition, which was heavy. A single round weighed 10 ounces. The typical load was 25 rounds. But Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried 34 rounds when he was shot and killed outside Ton K and he went down under an exceptional burden, more than 20 pounds of ammunition, plus the flak jacket and helmet, and rations, and water, and toilet paper, and tranquilizers, and all the rest, plus the unweighted fear. So again, we have polysyndeton, the addition of conjunctions between all the items in a list, and we also have that juxtaposition of tangible and intangible items, all the things he's physically carrying, but also carrying this idea of unweighted fear. He was dead weight. There was no twitching or flopping. Kiowa, who saw it happen, said it was like watching a rock fall or a big sandbag or something, just boom, then down. Not like the movies where the dead guy rolls around and does fancy spins and goes ass over tea kettle. Not like that, Kiowa said. The poor bastard just flat fuck fell. Boom. Down. Nothing else. It was a bright morning in mid-April. Lieutenant Cross felt the pain. He blamed himself. They stripped off Lavender's canteens and ammo, all the heavy things. And Rat Killy said the obvious. The guy's dead. And Mitchell Sanders used his radio to report one U.S. KIA killed in action and to request a chopper. Then they wrapped Lavender in his poncho. They carried him out to a dry paddy, established security, and sat smoking the dead man's dope until the chopper came. Lieutenant Cross kept to himself. He pictured Martha's smooth young face, thinking he loved her more than anything, more than his men, and now Ted Lavender was dead because he loved her so much and could not stop thinking about her. When the dust-off arrived, they carried Lavender aboard. Afterward, they burned Tan K. They marched until dusk, then dug their holes, and that night Kiowa kept explaining how you had to be there, how fast it was, how the poor guy just dropped like so much concrete. Boom, down, he said, like cement. We also get another exposure here to O'Brien's style, oftentimes writing these long, lengthy paragraphs or sentences, and then following them up with very short, staccato sentences. And even like this last example, not even a sentence at all, just a sentence fragment, like cement. Not a complete sentence, just a fragment. As a reader, that should strike us as unusual. He's not following the normal grammatical formations that we ask you guys to write your essays in. And so if he's varying from tradition, that should stand out as a reader, and we should pay extra attention to lines like that. 